Well, hello there. I didn't see you come in. Make yourself at home. Have a drink. While I give some attention to some underappreciated characters and storylines that I personally love. And I hope you grow to love as well. Hey there, everybody. Welcome back. Today we are reading Swamp Thing number 129. And just a little catch up on what's been going on. In the last couple of issues, we've seen Sunderland Corporation develop a monster named Proteus that ate toxic waste. They took it to a facility that was abandoned to test it out. And at first it was going great. It was doing its job eating a bunch of the old toxic waste. But then it noticed that there was something beyond the fence around the facility. So it was able to break out and it started walking through the forest. And apparently this dude is so toxic that when it walks through the forest, it actually injures the green itself so swamp thing hears the call of the green crying out in pain and he's torn because he just told abby a couple issues back that he would not leave her again for something that the parliament of trees or the green want him to do so in desperation he actually decides to make a double of himself to temporarily stand in while he goes to fight whatever's hurting the green and his hope for this is that by the time he gets back from fighting the monster and winning his daughter Tefe and his wife Abby would not notice anything different. So he leaves and he goes to fight the monster. He fights the monster, he wins, but the ground is still corrupted around him. So he decides to do something he's done before and reach into the ground himself and pull all the toxic waste into his current body. And then he would just leave that corrupted body and go into a new body. But unfortunately for him, that does not work because I guess the corruption is so deep that if he were to try to go into the green from the corrupted body, it would actually harm the green even more. So he's stuck inside this corrupted, dissolving body from toxic waste, and he has to try to walk home all the way from New Jersey where this took place. So as you can imagine, that takes a little bit longer than a night or whatever he was expecting to be gone. So while he's been gone at his house, the double has actually been doing a pretty good job pretending to be him. In fact, Tefe, his daughter, draws a picture of them together as a family, and it seems that the doppelganger is very touched by this, and he begins to fall into this domestic life over the next couple days while Swamp Thing's walking, so much so that we even saw him get intimate with Abby once. So it seems like he's really wanting this life for himself, and we're going to have to see what happens when Swamp Thing gets back. So with that being said, the first things first, we got the cover here with issue 129. And this is a kind of a cool landmark issue to call out because we have a different design on the title now. It says Swamp Thing in a different way. And also, this is the first issue that has the Vertigo branding on it from the Vertigo imprint at DC. And in celebration of that, we do get a really cool cover by Charles Vess of a very freaked out Swamp Thing who is looking at his dissolving hand in front of his face with very large red eyes. And we see that this is written by Nancy A. Collins with art by Scott Eaton and Kim DeMolder. And on the first page we see, we start off in Marsh Creek State Park in Eastern Pennsylvania. And we see some young boys around a fire. It seems like they've been camping. And these kids look like they're about maybe, I don't know, 14. And it's nighttime, so they're, of course, telling ghost stories to each other. So one of the kids is saying, And when they broke open the door, they found him alone in the bed, dead. And one of the boys cuts in saying, You call that scary? And the boy who told the story says, You got a better one, wise guy? And the boy who didn't like the story replies, You bet your ass. This is a true story, okay? There was this guy and his girlfriend... And they were out on a date. They decided to go out to an isolated stretch of Lover's Lane so they can smooch. So they're parked in the woods, right? And they're going at it hot and heavy, right? When suddenly, they hear this scrape, scrape along the side of the car. The girl's starting to get upset, thinking someone's out there watching them. But the guy tells her it's just a branch rubbing against the car door. Then suddenly, it happens again. Only this time, on the other side of the car. The girl doesn't like this at all and demands that her boyfriend take her home. So he puts the car into gear and they drive off. And on the way back, they turn on the radio to hear a news flash. It seems the cops were on the lookout for a one-handed psycho killer called The Hook, who had just escaped from a nearby prison. And when the guy got out to open the car door for his girlfriend, hanging from the passenger side handle was none other than... And then suddenly, Swamp Thing bursts from the woods, yelling... And of course, the kids freak out and begin to run away, and we see that the name of this issue is called Swamp Fever. And as we turn the page, we see the terrified kids running away. One of them is yelling, run, don't let it get you. And they leave Swamp Thing there, and as they run away, he's saying, no, please don't run away. I need help. 
So Swamp Thing is just standing there alone. He's still looking at his body because it's beginning to fall apart in front of his eyes. There's a bunch of like purple pustules that are growing all over him where the toxic waste is burning itself out. And Swamp Thing thinks, that was foolish. Why did I think humans could help me? Humans are responsible for what's wrong with me. Humans created the creature that contaminated me. Humans created the toxic waste that it hungered after. What a mess. I have to get home. I promised Abby I wouldn't leave her alone, but I can't enter the green. Not like this. I would spread my contagion throughout its vast network of life. Home. I have to go home. I can't let Abby find out the truth. And you might have noticed that this scene definitely has a lot of recap that we don't normally get from those issues. But I think it's because it's the first rebranded Vertigo title issue. So they were probably hoping people would jump on this issue because it is like this new designed logo. And they didn't want any new readers to get lost. So as Swamp Thing finishes his thoughts, all of a sudden he hears someone say, Shame on you, Alec. And he turns around quick because he knows that voice and he sees a ghostly apparition of Abby. And she says to him, You promised. You said you wouldn't leave again, remember? Then we get a little flashback of the moment that he promised and it was with them in bed. And she says, Promise me you won't go? And as Swamp Thing moves in for a kiss, he says, I promise. So this ghostly Abby is just throwing this in his face and she continues saying, and what did you do? Run off and leave me with one of your secondhand bodies. Thanks for caring. And then her body begins to dissolve and fade away. And as this happens, Swamp Thing runs towards the ghostly Abby and begins to plead with her saying, Abby, no, you don't understand. I did it for you. And then he collapses to the ground, holding his head saying, I didn't want to hurt you. Then we cut to Swamp Thing's house somewhere in Terrebonne Parish, which is in Louisiana. And we see on the porch, Abby and the doppelganger Swamp Thing are hanging out and they're kind of relaxing and cuddling with each other as they sit on the porch swing. And Abby is saying to the Swamp Thing double, it's such a beautiful night, isn't it, Alec? And the double replies, yes, very beautiful. And as she kind of leans into his chest, she stares up into his eyes and says, I've been so happy the last few days, knowing that I don't have to compete with the parliament and the green for your undivided attention. It makes me feel special, you know? And the double says, yes, I know. And we see a little smile on this Swamp Thing double's face. And I don't think this is supposed to be like an evil smile. I think he's just super happy with this life. And since he's so happy, he actually moves in and gives her a big kiss. And they start to make out. And then we cut above them where on a balcony, we see Lady Jane can see them on the balcony. And she knows that that is the doppelganger Swamp Thing because she saw him make it. And she walks back into the house and you can definitely tell that she is conflicted about this. She doesn't want to tell on Swamp Thing, but she's also friends with Abby. And she knows that this has definitely gone further than Swamp Thing wanted. And that this thing is taking advantage of Abby's ignorance that it's the double. Then we cut to the Sunderland corporate headquarters in Washington, D.C. And we see Connie Sunderland is showing a man named Dr. Polygon into a very secure area of the lab. So as he looks around, he says, this is quite an operation you have here, Connie. And she replies, please call me Miss Sunderland, Dr. Polygon, if you wish to retain your position. And Dr. Polygon replies, whatever you say, Miss Sunderland. Then we see her walk up to a very heavy metal door with very high security protocols on it. And the sign over it says Sunderland Corp Cryogenics Vault. And we see Connie pull out a key card as she's prompted by the door's robotic voice to enter her key card. And she does and the door opens. And as they walk in between the cryogenic pods, she explains to Dr. Polygon, My father was a great believer in longevity enhancement. Whether it was through geriatric surgery, glandular rejuvenation, or cryogenic preservation. He made sure that the company kept abreast of the latest advancements in life extension, no matter how outlandish. And Dr. Polygon replies, Years ago, I approached your father for a grant for research into spiritual ergonomics. He did not seem to find my theory worthy of his attention at the time. And Connie replies, Yes, well, my father was not omniscient. He did not foresee use of your services, nor did he anticipate his murder at the hands of a monster. And then they stop in front of a certain pod and we see it is like the main one in the center of the room kind of thing. And as they look at it, she continues. My father was a great man, Dr. Polygon. 
He was a war hero, a brilliant businessman, a true American. He deserved a far more noble fate. And it's up to you, my good doctor, to see that the wheel of destiny is turned backward, that the jaws of death are pried open, and that General Carlton Sunderland is free to walk the face of the earth once more. Then we cut back to Swamp Thing somewhere in eastern Pennsylvania, and he's just walking through the forest thinking to himself as usual right now, and he's thinking, where am I? What am I? Am I a plant that dreams it is a man? Or am I a man who dreams he is a plant? And what's going on here is I believe the chemicals are affecting his brain and he's having trouble remembering what has happened in the past and what's going on and exactly who he is. And he continues, am I alive or dead? Or have I even been born at all? Am I a god or a monster? Am I a servitor of the green or its master? Am I a husband, a father, a lover, a friend? My head, it hurts. Why can't things be easy just once? Why must my life be filled with conflict and horror? So while he was thinking each one of those words like father, lover, friend, we were getting a flash of each of those things. So when it says father, we're seeing him play with Tefe. When it says lover, we're seeing him make love to Abby. When it says friend, we're seeing Chester and Jojo, and they're shaking hands with Swamp Thing. And then when he's asking why this horror must be in his life, we see above him there is hovering a bunch of cool classic images from the original Swamp Thing run and other runs in the series. So we're seeing the Patchwork Man from issue 3, I believe. We're seeing the horrific Dr. Arcane from issue 10, when he remade his body for the first time. We see General Sunderland and Constantine's even there. And we even see Batman in the background because he's appeared a couple times in the series. Then Swamp Thing begins to think of other monsters he's fought more recently. We see a werewolf and the evil pirate Dark Conrad and the amalgamation monster from the swamp named La Perdu. And over these he's saying, Why must there always be death and unhappiness stalking my shadow? Why can't they just leave me in peace. And over this last line, we actually see the they he's probably talking about is the Parliament of Trees, because we see a very tall wall of tree trunks, and on the top of them, all the faces from the Parliament. We also get a face that looks kind of familiar from a Marvel character named Man-Thing, so I think they're throwing that in there for fun. So while Swamp Thing was thinking about all this, he fell to the ground, and he's holding his head with both hands, and he's thinking, why, why? And then all of a sudden, his body begins to give out. A hole in his head ruptures and liquid begins spurting out of it and also his eyes pop out of his skull. And as he tries to recover from that, he's thinking, am, am I dying? Can I die? Or is there only this unending pain? And then he drops to the ground on his back and he begins writhing. And then from there, his organs burst from his chest. And even this doesn't kill him. It's just him in a lot of pain. And we can see coming from the hole now in his torso, there's like fumes from toxic waste dissolving stuff. And he sits up onto his knees and we see his intestines and a bunch of organs fall out of his torso. And he thinks, so hard to think losing control of my physical integrity have to hang on the best I can until the toxins have worked their way out of my system. And I guess in response to this toxic waste and him trying to purge it, he begins to grow some like vines on his head, kind of looking like hair. And as this transformation is taking place, someone behind him says, why do you cling so tightly to this shell? And Swamp Thing turns and says, who? And then he sees another ghostly figure standing in front of him. And this time the apparition is of his former body, Alec Holland. And Ghost Alec is saying to him, you seem surprised. And Swamp Thing says, a am I dead? And Alec answers, that depends on whether you decide I'm really a ghost or simply a fever dream. And Swamp Thing reaches out to him with one arm saying, Holland, please help me reach my wife. And as Swamp Thing stands up and walks over to him to like grab at Alec, he actually ends up running through it because it's just an apparition. And that apparition says, still playing at being me, are you? And Swamp Thing answers, No, I've known I'm not Alec Holland for years. And Alec replies, You know that's a lie, my friend. Alec Holland was the family man, not you. 
What you feel for your wife and child is a dead man's legacy. And there's a little bit of a smirk on this Alec Holland apparition's face. And so I think maybe he's trying to taunt Swamp Thing somehow. And upon hearing those words, Swamp Thing says, No, that's not true. And as he says this, his teeth are kind of gritted together. And it seems like he's really trying to focus and fight what Alec just said to him. And Alec replies, It's not true, huh? Well, what does your precious wife call you then? Whose name does she call out in the heat of passion? And Swamp Thing grabs his head again and says, Shut up. Shut up! And we see a burst of energy come from his body, and that Alec Holland apparition is pushed away. And we see that burst of energy was not benign as we turn the page, because we're getting a bunch of different scenes from different areas in Pennsylvania, where the plant life has gone crazy in this moment of anger from Swamp Thing. We see a woman, and out of her kitchen sink, all these vines are growing out of it. And then at a restaurant, a man is trying to eat his salad, but it's attacking him back. There's a house plant that's growing its vines and wrapping around a cat. And we see a boy playing baseball, and his bat is turning into a tree. Then we cut back to Swamp Thing, and he's fallen to his knees again, and he's saying, Abby. And then he passes out and falls down to the ground. Then we cut to Huma, Louisiana, where we're at Chester's house. And we see Abby and Chester are inside talking as Chester is getting ready to move. And Abby is saying, I'm really going to miss you, Chester. You've been one of the best friends I've ever had. And Chester replies, yeah, I'm going to miss you too. But I've been putting off doing something with my life for so long. Now's as good a time to start as any. And Abby replies, as much as I hate the idea of you leaving, I realize what you're doing is right for you. I know this town doesn't offer a lot right now. And then Chester looks outside his window, kind of thinking, and he says, Huma used to be an okay place to live. A little backward, maybe, but a place I felt comfortable living in. That's not true anymore. Things have changed forever, and not for the better. And when he says this, we see a flash of the burning cross that the KKK put on his lawn when the black boyfriend of his gay roommate moved in. And then Abby interrupts those thoughts, saying, And New Orleans isn't exactly on the other side of the world. You'll still be traveling down here to visit us, right? And Chester says, Sure thing. And then he looks a little serious, and he says, uh, look, my leaving isn't going to be a problem for you and Alec and the baby, will it? I mean, you don't have any reliable transportation or means of communicating with the outside world. And then Abby gives him a big hug and says, Chester, I realize I've become reliant on you for helping me get to and from town, not to mention all kinds of favors. And believe me, I appreciate it, but you shouldn't live your life just so I won't be inconvenienced. Besides, it's not like I'm living out in the swamp in a grass shack. As long as I have Alec with me, I shouldn't have any problems I can't deal with. And then her and Chester embrace in a hug that's pretty familiar. I mean, if you saw it from the street, you might think they're a couple. And she says, it's a good thing I'm a happily married woman, Chester Williams, or I'd be tempted to run off with you myself. And of course, she's just joking. But actually, from the street, we do see someone is focusing on them hugging with a camera, and they're taking pictures of this scene. And I believe the photographer is actually Representative Barron, the Republican candidate who ran for governor earlier in this run. And you would think he would hire like a PI to do this work, but no, nah, he just, he's just going to sit outside her house with his own camera. And as he's taking pictures, he says, tisk tisk, such shameful behavior. Then we get to Swamp Thing up in eastern Pennsylvania as his body is dissolving into the ground. And he's still in the same spot that he fell face first in before. And someone off panel says, Prime Founder, wake up. And to this, Swamp Thing tries to raise his head, and we see that he's pretty messed up still, and he says, Abby. But when he looks up, he sees Lady Jane standing in front of him, and she says, No, not Abby. And then Swamp Thing asks, Lady Jane, how did you know where to find me? Then as Swamp Thing looks to her left, we see that there's a giant elemental standing next to her, and this is the elemental known as Am. He is one of the three original members of the Parliament of Green, along with Yggdrasil and Toru. And Am is actually a lot larger than we've seen him before. He's about four times taller than Swamp Thing, and he's got like a humanoid body, but his head is still in the shape of a horseshoe crab. And he says to Swamp Thing, So, you have failed yet again. And a surprise Swamp Thing says, Am? And then as we turn the page, we see another elemental is saying, You try our patience, Prime Founder. How long must we tolerate your pretense of humanity? And we see it's not just AM and this other elemental. There's a, all the elementals Swamp Thing has ever run into during the series are appearing in front of him. There's even one that looks like a saber-toothed tiger and it's saying, Your loyalty belongs to us. 
your first, your true family. And now you have failed us both. But Swamp Thing replies to the Sabretooth saying, I haven't failed anyone. I haven't failed the Parliament or my family. Isn't that true, Lady Jane? But Lady Jane doesn't say anything and she just looks at him and Swamp Thing kind of begs to her, Lady Jane. And then we see Yggdrasil appear behind Swamp Thing and he says, Enough. The members of the Parliament are right. The time has come for you to decide whether you are to remain the Green's champion or you are to be husband to the human female and father to her child. And Swamp Thing yells out to this, No! I refuse to choose! You can't make me choose! And then it seems like all the elementals from the parliament that were here all vanished because they're not real and they're all in his head. But in his head, he does hear a voice saying, Free will is not the lot of the planet kingdom. It is the conceit of the flesh. Remember what it was like before you learned of our existence. With us, you are a god on earth. Without us, you are a muck-encrusted mockery of a man. Which will it be? So it seems like the Parliament was actually talking to Swamp Thing through the green. Either that or he's having a really crazy hallucination that is just bringing up Swamp Thing's issues that he's been keeping down inside of him for a while. But we're going to have to find out next time because that was the end of the issue. So if you guys have any comments, questions, or suggestions, you can email me at planes, trains, and comic books, all one word at gmail.com. And remember, until next time, stay swampy.